Good Monday morning, and thanks for listening to my musing today, which is still about the creepy crawlies, the things that go bump in the night. Real monsters. I've talked for a couple of weeks about how the, the folklore that we have, the stories that haunt our, our dreams and uh, our, our waking hours too, maybe a, a bit, the things that we see in the movie theaters, even though they might seem like fiction, perhaps it's the case that they are a, a proxy, a way for us projecting the fears of ourself and our society into something that we can hope that is only fictional, things that are stuck in the pages of books and comic books, things that are only silvery and dangerous on the silver screen. But where did those stories come from? When people were sitting around the campfires, why were stories of things like vampires, werewolves, wendigos, why did they come up? What spark in people's imaginations made them fear those specific kinds of mo monsters, assuming that they are not uh, real and detailed accounts of what actually happens to us. How do we think that our deepest, darkest stories, the things that creep us out the most, how might those be a way of us understanding the real monsters and the real fears that exist in the real world? I think that creative expression in the way of horror movies, horror stories, ghost stories told around the campfire, they might tell us something about our own culture and the real monsters that exist in our communities and maybe within ourselves. As we move close or around Halloween and All Hallows Eve, when the moon is bright and uh, the days are gray, I think that speculating, looking into these stories might help us to look into some of the problems that we face, not just socially in the world of politics or church life, COVID and pandemics, maybe these monster stories help us to pinpoint the things that are within ourselves that transform us from humans into monsters. And today, maybe that's to say the things that make us afraid of witches. Witches are the fear for today. And uh, for those who've read The Crucible, for those who have thought about Salem, maybe the real monster is not the witch herself, Maybe it's the witch hunt. What is it about a witch hunt that makes us afraid? And what is it about uh, a young witch or an innocent girl that would give us reason for fear? How did these stories come about? And what about those uh, Sanderson sisters from Hocus Pocus? How did we get the image of a certain period in, uh, in time, a certain kind of hat, a certain kind of broom, a black cat and big bubbly cauldrons? What's all that all about and where did it come from? Well, if you've been wondering about these sorts of things and why we should fear witches and witch hunts, if you wonder about the strange stories of the Bible, about Moses battling with the magicians uh, in Egypt, or about Aaron's staff that budded, maybe like a magic wand, well, these are things that I might have a little bit of background for. So if you'd like to hear that background, and if you'd like to make sure that you are yourself not a witch or a part of a witch hunting party, maybe you'll stick around. So, maybe I've let it slip a couple of times that one of my, I don't know if you should call it a hobby, is beer drinking. I happen to be fond of that magic elixir. And, uh... Since I've been on parental leave, if you've been wondering how a pastor spends his time whenever he's not changing diapers and getting the groceries, it might be the case that I brewed at home for the first time ever. What does that have to do with witches, you might be thinking? Well, I learned a couple of things whenever I tried to brew beer at home for the first time. The first thing you need is a big bubbling pot. Beer starts off an awful lot like a tea. You start with the grains, you put them in a, a sock or a sack, and you put them in this big bubbling cauldron. And you have to wait, you have to let it steep. And then you add other ingredients like malt. Malt is the thing that the yeast will eventually eat. So you have this tea beer with no alcohol called wort. Witches have warts, don't they? Hmm. So you're 
sitting around this big pot, this big cauldron, stirring your wort, your kind of tea, and all of a sudden some magic starts to happen. The, the grains and the water and the malt, they're all mixing together. And then this, uh, for us, we get to have a, a bag of yeast, active cultivated strains. And you throw them in the pot and we know scientifically what yeast does. It eats the sugar from the, the malt and the grain and the byproducts are alcohol and carbonation. That whenever you open up a can of beer. But our knowledge of yeast only goes back so far. Yeast is a fungus that exists in the air. It would land on any sort of old uh, fruit or uh, cauldron of wort, and it would start to be a kind of magical difference. Chemistry, but one that only a very few people understood. Brewing in the past uh, is not exactly what you might see at the Guinness Brewery in Baltimore today. It was a cottage industry, literally, done in cottages. And so while the men might be out in the field harvesting the grain or the malt or the hops or something like that, the women who stayed in the house were doing their own kind of home ec. They might be weaving or they might be brewing beer, mostly for their own consumption. But every once in a while you have a little extra beer or you're especially good at brewing. And what would you do to let people know that you might have an extra bottle or growler lying around full of beer. Evidence shows that they might stick a broom in their their door or in the dirt. That a broom, maybe with the bristles painted a certain color, would let passers-by know that there was a little extra something to be had in a certain cottage. These brewesses might also be known as alewives. And we get the name alewife not just from the fish, but from the fact that women were the primary brewers all the way back to the time of Egypt in these small kinds of cottage industries. But for those of you who might be around beer or beer drinkers, it's the case that if there are a couple of extra bottles lying around and men go into a certain cottage where there's a broom handle sticking out of the door, there's a big bubbling cauldron in the middle of the room and fellows stay in that sort of cottage too long, they might not always act themselves. Drinking a certain kind of elixir or potion poured out of that cauldron might make them act a little different. And there's all kinds of differences from whenever you drink what's in that bubbling cauldron. Some people are extra jubilant, extra lustful, extra jokey or touchy. Some people are angry. Beer casts all kinds of spells on people who drink too much. Enough that people might start to worry about what those women who were making their men act all differently were really up to. Now, if you're making beer, you probably need a lot of grain. If you have a lot of grain, you probably have mice running around. And you know what is pretty good about uh, running off mice? Cats. So we have big bubbling cauldrons. We have black cats. We have brooms letting people know that there are potions to be had. And what about the big pointy hat? Well, at a certain period in time, they were all in fashion. And if you were walking around in a market to say that you don't just have to come to the cottage, but maybe you want to buy something in the marketplace, maybe a nice tall hat helps people to know where to find the alewife. The point is that women did almost all of that work and women passed on a special knowledge to one another about how to do the work of brewing. If your mom was an alewife, maybe she passed on the secrets the perfect recipes, a certain kind of hops, a certain amount of time to wait, all these secrets about how to make this magical elixir in the cauldron, the elixir that we call beer. So, when men start to act differently, maybe whenever you have it out for someone, maybe whenever you're brewing beer and you don't know all of the intricacies of yeast, it is the case that there is bad beer, maybe unhealthy food or unhealthy water, and so maybe whenever you drink it, you get a little bit sick. It causes people to act differently. Maybe people get ill. All these things, well, that's what witches do, isn't it? They brew something kind of in an alchemical way with some magic based on some science that we might not know. It causes people to act differently. And if I wanted to open my own brewery as a man and I wanted to industrialize, maybe I would need a little story 
to help rid these women of all of their power and all of their little cottage industries. Maybe I say something like, they're up to no good. Bubble, bubble, toil, and trouble. Who knows what they're putting in these beers? What you need is you need someone you can trust. An industrial brewer, someone, a man perhaps, who does things efficiently, that offers jobs to people who are out of work. This shouldn't be in the cottage industry anymore where you don't know what's going on. Come and join the brewery. That's almost exactly what happened. Historically, we know that economic forces in the first industrial revolution hit uh, the, the garment industry the most when people had looms in their home and other cottage industry. So when factories started to open up to make um, more textiles and more cloths, the cottage industries went, uh, went under. But the textile industry wasn't the only business that was industrializing during the early first industrial revolution in England. Breweries also went by the wayside. And to make people feel less bad about that, well, you scapegoat the witches, the people with the tall hats, the people who make their men differently, where there might be bad beer or bad potions and you don't know what they do. So who is the real monster? Where do we get this notion of witches over the cauldron with their brooms, tall hats, and black cats? Well, it's from alewives. And the monsters are not so much those who brood, unless of course you're a teetotaler. The monsters might be those on a witch hunt, those who see women's empowerment, women's businesses as something that is a kind of dark evil. So the witches perhaps were brewing, over-serving, allowing men to get drunk or act differently, and that was a bad thing because there are some seedy things that go on in bars and ale houses. But what about the people who hunted the witches, the forces that seek to industrialize, to push women out of the marketplace, and men who can't stand for women to have a power or knowledge that they themselves cannot have. The things that happened in cottages, the things that were old wives' tales, or the businesses and the skills that were passed from woman to woman, well, those are scary things to a certain kind of man. We see those stories in the Bible, too. It wasn't that long ago that Susan preached about Shifra and Pua, the midwives. There were not many men in the time uh, who would have delivered babies. There were not offices for OBGYNs. It was knowledge passed from woman to woman. And so whenever you have the forces of life, the chemistry and the science of beer, things that were uh, spheres of knowledge existing almost entirely for women, and men who wanted to control women, or men who wanted that kind of knowledge, well, they'd go on witch hunts, saying that witches were almost always women with special kinds of knowledge and abilities, who cast spells and had controls over the forces of nature, and that they should be eradicated. There are other stories that aren't related to brewing that have to do with necromancy and... Uh, Wizardry, war, uh, uh, wizardry um, warlocks, and those sorts of things. We see Moses with a magician's magic show in front of Pharaoh where the sea turns to blood and it turns back, but not for the Egyptian uh, magicians there. Whenever we are picking Moses' uh, successor, it was the case that Aaron's bud, or Aaron's wand, happened to have flowers shoot out of it. Well, that's a magic trick we still do in magic kits. You hold up your wand, and all of a sudden, shake, shake, and it becomes a bunch of flowers. There are other bits uh, about mediums. It's the case that in the Bible, Saul goes to a medium in the hopes of talking to a long-dead prophet. So those things aren't all related to brewing. But I do wonder, for us, how we understand the folklore and the dynamics of witches, and I think, for me at least, what's more nerve-wracking are the witch hunts to go after young girls who have promise, who have uh, special abilities, and maybe some sense of sexual desire too. The people who fear those things, independence, uh, independent thinking, certain skills that give empowerment to women, well, there are some people who like to go on witch hunts, aren't there? Those things that threaten the life that they have 
who seem to show all of their cards to hold everything out in the open. It's not the case that everything is held out in the open. It is the case that there are certain spheres of knowledge that get passed on from one person to another. Presbyterians have a certain way of doing things in-house. Uh, people who work in other realms of work have a certain kind of jargon, a certain kind of spell casting that they're able to do. And it's a large looming question whether we should go after all of those sources of knowledge, all the ways that people pick themselves up by their bootstraps, find ways to make it in the world economically or otherwise. Um, where should those things be kept secret? And where should those things be brought out into the open? Well, that's the question between witches and those who hunt witches. I don't know all of the things that happen in a girl's locker room, and I think that's a good thing. I don't know all the conversations that mothers have with daughters, and I'm very happy that in our future, uh, Sarah will probably be telling Gwyneth and Lula a few things that I don't know about, I don't care to know about. But as we have a society that still, in certain ways, makes witches out of people, that says that women should not be trusted in their own decision-making uh, and that things need to be dragged out of them, whether they sink or swim, proving them a witch or not. Well, the point is witches aren't the only monsters. Those who hunt them also seem to be transformed into some kind of monster. Now, what we think about alcohol, what we think about potions and those sorts of things, uh, there's probably more that I could muse about related to the pharmaceutical industry or to alcohol in general or other sorts of mind-altering substances. I'll say this just very briefly as a kind of bonus. I once heard a debate, uh, and the frame of that debate was whether drugs should be legalized. One of those people was talking only about the legalization of marijuana. And the counter argument that was not for legalization said, it's not fair for you only to talk about marijuana. If we're talking about the legalization of drugs, you should also be considering harder drugs like heroin or methamphetamine. What that person missed was that he was not talking about things like Oxycontin or uh, opiates that are prescribed. We use all sorts of drugs in our society. We have all sorts of problems with them, but they are very powerful. They do all sorts of things. How we understand pharmaceuticals, pharm pharma reps, and uh, legalization for recreational drugs, uh, that is one arena where it does seem that through the power of chemistry, we have something like witches and witch hunts. Which side are you on on those sorts of things? How do you understand regulation and legalization for all of the substances that alter our states or alter our bodies? My point is, it's all complicated and it's all connected. Maybe it's even too hard for us to talk about. And it's for that reason that I think we continue to have stories about witches and those who hunt them. How do we understand what is bad and good when certain people have certain abilities to alter our sense of who we are and who we might become? On the one hand, things open our minds. They change what we feel. Whenever we're depressed, we can cheer right up or we can become completely numb. Some of those things happen when we go to a psychiatrist and they prescribe a pill for us. Other times that happens whenever you go to the bar, maybe a little too often, and you self-medicate. What are the real monsters that we face whenever we look at ourselves in the mirror and we think, am I the person I want to be? Is there someone I'd like to be who is different? Maybe what we become is a monster. Maybe what we become is a truer version of ourselves, a version that we think is more likable, more enjoyable. And there's all sorts of potions and elixirs that might help us to do that. So what's the antidote to the witches and wizards out there who would seek to sell us in snake oil and beer and those sorts of things? Well, I don't ever miss an opportunity to quote Mr. Rogers who says, and I think, speaking for God somewhat, I like you as you are, exactly and precisely. I think you've turned out nicely and I like you as you are. Who you see in the mirror that might be distorted by a whole host of things going on, whether chemically induced or otherwise. But I hope when you look in the mirror, what you see is not a monster. You see someone created in the image of God, someone worthy of dignity and respect, someone loved by God and cared for 
hopefully, by the church. And I hope you know that today. That's what I've been musing about, witches, wizards, and uh, maybe a pint of bitter. But who knows? Thanks for listening to me today. Uh, there is one more monster that I'd really like to get to, even though it'll be a little past Halloween. Frankenstein's monster. The monster Adam. The new man. The new Prometheus. What was that all about? Maybe next week we talk about Mary Shelley and what in the heck is going on there. There will only be a few young Frankenstein references, I promise. Thanks for listening to my musing this week. I'll see you next Monday.